I'll start over. Welcome everyone to the November 16, 2023 meeting of the Baltimore County Planning Board. It is now called to order. I'm Nancy Hafford, the chairwoman of the board, and we will now start with the meeting with the roll call to account from the members that are present, which finally we've got them all pretty much present. Mr. Array. Here. Ms. Brophy. Here. Ms. German. Here. Mr. Hafers, absent. Mr. Heckman. Here. Mr. Heinel. Here. Mr. Hinton. Here. Mr. Halitka. Here. Mr. Johnston. Here. Mr. McGinnis. Here. Mr. Perlow. Here. Ms. Pinero. Here. Mr. Warren. Here. Ms. Wolfson. Here. Please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Board members. Please be sure to um, unmute and mute your microphones and watch your neighbor. Mrs. Patchek, are there any changes to the agenda as published? He did add uh, item number four on your other business regarding the EV charging station report. Okay, so uh, please refer to the agenda that's in front of you to make sure you have the current one. In the November 9th, 2023 email, you received draft minutes from the November 2nd meeting. Has everyone <laughs> had a minute to look at the draft minutes? Are there any questions? Corrections, none. May I entertain a motion to accept the motion. minutes as circulated? Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. First on the agenda, we have an opportunity to further discuss and then vote on the short-term rental report. This item was first introduced to the board September 21st, and a public hearing was conducted on October 5th. Staff from the Department of Planning and the Department of Permits and Approvals and Inspections are here to answer any question the board may have as we discuss before we take a vote. Would Mr. Lafferty or Ms. Nash like to make any comments at this time? Uh, no, ma'am, have nothing to add from uh, the presentation as, at the last meeting. Okay. Board members, are there any outstanding questions for Mr. Lafferty or Ms. Nash? <laughs> None? If there's no further questions, may I have, have a motion? Be it moved that the planning board is accepting of the short-term rentals report introduced October 19th, 2023, and forwards it on to the county council for further review and consideration. Is, thank you. Now, is there a motion and a second? Second. And then I'll do a roll call. Mr. Array? Yes. Ms. Brophy? Aye. Ms. German? Yes. Mr. Heckman? Aye. Mr. Heinel? Aye. Mr. Hinton? Aye. Mr. Halitka? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. McGinnis? Aye. Mr. Perlow? Aye. Ms. Pinero? Yes. Mr. Warren? Opposed. Ms. Wolfson? Aye. Thank you. The motion carries. Mr. Johnson, you have a question? Was this the same um, discussion we had when we asked about the data for the crimes in the area? <laughs> Stop poking. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Let me gentle touch. Um, Ms. Johnson, I, I, frankly, I don't recall requests for crime in the area. Part of what we indicated was that the police do under the social host ordinance currently have the right and opportunity to respond um, to unruly homes that they've been called to uh, often by neighbors. Um, 
we were not able previously to get that data from the police. If you want us to pursue that for you, we're more than happy to try to follow up. I'd like, like, like to change those. I'd like to change lines more. Okay. All right. All right. Let's do a roll call again. Mr. Array. Aye. Miss Brophy. Aye. Miss German. Aye. Mr. Hafer's not here. Mr. Heckman. Aye. Mr. Heinel. Aye. Mr. Hinton. Nay. Mr. Halipka. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. McGinnis. Aye. Mr. Perlow. Aye. Ms. Pinero. Aye. Mr. Warren. You Aye. Ms. Wolfson. Aye. Okay. All right. Motion carries. We're going to switch our agenda around a little bit and go to the Madam EVs. Madam Chair, before we get into that, if I may, just thank uh, Sally Nash and Pete Gutwald from the Department of Permits Approval and Inspection as well as Jen Nugent from our department for the work on the report. Uh, the, the council sent us two at one time, as you know, um, staff really, I think, knuckled down and did a good job and hopefully in providing sufficient information, although we realize this is an ever-changing uh, issue in, in communities in the county. So I just wanted to publicly thank them for all the hard work they put into this. Thank you, Mr. Lafferty. And th I thank you too, Ms. Nash. Okay, Mr. Lafferty is now here to address the changes to the EVCS report based on the amendments voted on at the November 2nd meeting. Are there any additional questions for Mr. Lafferty? Or Mr. Lafferty, is there anything you want to share? I, I, I do. We sent out the amended and, and changed report based upon the four uh, changes that the board um, made uh, in the draft, and I don't know if people have the copies or access to them. Uh, we made changes on page four, which uh, further went into the uh, National Fire Protection Association and other firefighters concern, including the state fire marshal, uh, about uh, the intensity of uh, lithium ion battery fires, uh, and also then address uh, the fact that there are our own fire department is also quite concerned about these these issues um, that's that's basically in the background uh, and then in the actual recommendations we in item number three included bollards to uh, address the issue of potential damage uh, indicated that um, because of the potential dangers from fires uh, the board recommended that the fire department be provided adequate capacity and resources to prepare for such high temperature fires. Uh, we eliminated the chart that was in the prior uh, report and indicate a cumulative minimum requirement of uh, 5% uh, and in, of installed capable and ready EVs and a minimum of 20% by 2035. And then also acknowledge uh, the fire code need to be reviewed uh, because of potential in garages uh, in structures. Uh, those were the four items that we picked up and they've now been incorporated. That's the last couple are on uh, page seven of the report. Just want to make sure that we address the concerns the board had before we transmit this to the county council. Thank you, Mr. Lafferty. Board members, do you have any questions for Mr. Lafferty? Emily? Thanks. Um, and thank you, Director Lafferty and your team for putting this together. There's just a couple items, if I may, to add to that. Um, when you had identified the zones, that would automatically be permitted um, as a principal use. You had listed a bunch of zones, including a lot of the business zones, but B, um, BL, business local, wasn't listed. So it has BLR and BM, but for some reason BL wasn't listed. So I think that should be added. Um, and then I don't know if I need to make a motion for that or. I would recommend if you want that additional change that you make a motion. Okay. Once you make them all. Yeah. And then the other item was just um, a clarification on the public space permit. Um, you had you didn't mention the ballers and everything um, that we had asked for. So I appreciate that. But I was just wondering, is this public space permit process going to be the same? And this is number two. I apologize if people are following along. Is this permit the same process for privately installed 
um, and county installed EVSEs on the public right of way, or are, are there different permit processes? Because this looks like it's just one process. It, it's any uh, public space. So if it's in the public right of way, there would, there is currently a process that's utilized. Ms. Nash could give you more details. Um, it often we just saw one recently that requires a franchise agreement with the county, for instance. Okay. Uh, so whether it's if, as long as the public space, public right of way is being utilized, that's what this is intended to address. Okay, so that process isn't changed for this, it's the same. But the recommendation is to look at streamlining it to make it simpler than what it currently is. Okay, no, that's fine, thank you. Um, and then we had talked about the signage before on number three, and there was a quote added that said the sign would be approved by the police department stating the prohibition. But on the top part, it says the county should establish the basic design standards for signage, setbacks, et cetera. So I just, I don't remember the police department being brought up in the past. So I'm not sure if any other board member remembers that. But to me, it seems conflicting that you would have signage that's approved by the county, but then also it has to be approved by the police department. I'm not seeing the reference to the police department. Well. Um, it's in the, so in number three, one, two, after the third paragraph in the quotations, where it says a person may not park, yada, 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 vehicles, use of plug-in vehicles with sign approved by the police department stating the prohibition and or provides access to a public vehicle. That's in county code. Okay, so that is not changing. You're just saying that the county is going to establish standards for the signage. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. We can't change that. Yeah, no, that stays. Thank you. Um, and then the only other item I was going to bring up, and I can bring this all up at the same time, was um, we talked about adjusting the required minimum parking standards because the EVSEs take up larger parking spaces. So it was addressed in the last sentence of number four, but not specifically. It just says the county should incorporate minimum EV parking standards into calculations. Um, at the end of that, I wanted to add, by decreasing the parking ratio required for each zone by the appropriate number of parking spaces, um, i.e., if an EVSE parking space takes up one and a half spaces, then the required minimum parking of that zone shall be decreased by that amount. Because the issue is, if the EV spaces take up more parking spaces and, like, the parking lot was originally supposed to have 100 spaces for 10,000 square feet. I'm just using round numbers. Now, all of a sudden, you can only fit 80 parking spaces for 10,000 square feet because of the larger EVSE parking. So I just I wanted to clarify that. Um, I'm not aware, for instance, when BGE installed the level two parking um, uh, EV charging stations at public spaces like at Randallstown Community Center or wherever else. It's the same parking space. There's no demit, there's no increased width. So when we when we installed them when I was at Towson Town Center, they were larger because you had to install the bollards around it, similar to the safety requirements that we're talking about. And because the I want to say it was probably a level three though, so it might be a little bit different from the level one, level two. The size of the actual unit also took up space. So it was larger. So I'm not saying that. We should just change the minimum. Well, well, let me, let me. I'm not just I, saying we should just change the requirements based on, I'm just saying if it does, like if a regular parking space is 10 feet wide and all of a sudden EVSE is 12 feet wide, that it gets adjusted accordingly. That's what I'm suggesting to the board. Of course, I will make a motion. This is just me. But mentioning certainly, this, I mean, this is a recommendation from the planning board. And if you want the um, council to re-examine the parking requirements based upon this, that can be one of the uh, recommendations. So if you can put it in a motion, though, so we can capture that. Okay. And, okay and then the only last thing was um, we did talk about the 5% and 20% by the certain time frame, so thank you for that. I just wanted to say that the 5% should be by year-end 2025, only because we're almost in 2024. So I didn't want it to look like it was our recommendation that January of 2025, all of a sudden, everybody is now required 5% EV. SE spaces, and that was the only other thing. That wasn't what I'd understood, but I'll correct that. Thank you. Mr. Perlow? Um, I would suggest, Matt, Madam Chair, if we're going to change the report again, 
then we need a motion before we end up with conversation, please. Could okay, we absolutely. That? So do you want me to make So what I need you to do is package up what you just said. Okay. And, and if you want to put them all together, okay. Ms. Brophy? Okay, so I'd like to make a motion on the current report that was sent to us by planning staff that incorporated our changes that we voted on the last time. I would like to add BL Business Local to the zones that are listed that would permit the level three EVSE should be permitted as a principal use on publicly owned land and at a minimum in the following zones. And I suggest BL be added to that as well as adding specifically language in here that states that the minimum, the required minimum parking ratio required for all the uses within the zones would be decreased by the appropriate number of parking spaces if EVSE parking spaces take up more than one regular size parking space as well as adding in year end to the 2025 requirement. That would be a minimum of 5% of all parking spaces be EV capable, EV ready, or EV installed by year end 2025, and a minimum of 20% of all spaces by 2035. Do I hear a second? Second. And I'm gonna do a roll call. Mr. Perlow, Mr. Perlow, I think I have a question. I just had a quick comment. It is very important that the spaces, the number continue for bankers because when we send our title work to them, they count the number of spaces tying it into the zoning code. So if we in the future do start to lose some spaces in a parking, then I think that council does need to consider changing the zoning on those particular shopping centers, especially. Thank you, Mr. Perlow. Ms. Wolfson. I might argue that I, that doesn't work. I might argue that um, that the spaces that are dedicated to um, EV charging are act technically bays like they would be for a gas station. They aren't actually parking spaces, are they? They're, for, they're, so they're utility park, spaces. So they're, they're parking spaces that have a charger at the, at the, the head of it. Um, and they could be expected just to stay there for the duration of however long their trip is. Like, like you would yes, well, I think park. It's, it's, it could be enforced by the owner of the property. They could re require someone to have their vehicle moved. Any other questions or comments before we go for a vote? I have one quick question. I remember when we were first talking about this, that um, uh, one of the members from, from the Department of Planning had mentioned that it, it was also a component to this percentages about just being able to expand as the years go on. So does that make sense? Like building out a fa an electrical foundation that can handle a hundred spaces, even though today we're only asking for 5%. Mm -hmm. Is that still going to be a part of the plan? The way the board uh, approved the uh, change, it did not make that distinction. The original report included a provision that you would have a certain amount of EV capable, EV installed, EV ready, and, and the levels really based upon how much electrical, how much the electricity is already in, in place. And that was not the way the board approved the uh, change during the last meeting. Any other questions or comments? If not, Mr. Array, yes. are we voting on the amendment? Or yes, no? on the amendment. Yes. Ms. Brophy. Yes. Ms. German. Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Heckman. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Heinel. Yes. Mr. Hinton. Yes. Mr. Halipka. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. McGinnis. Yes. Mr. Perlow. Yes. Ms. Pinero. Yes. Mr. Warren. Yes. Ms. Wolfson. No. Thank you. Motion carries.
I think we have enough time to move on with the agenda. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Pacek will now fill us in on major actions of the November 9th, 2023 Landmark Preservation Commission meeting. At their November 9th, 2023 meeting, the LPC voted to issue three certificates of appropriateness for the following properties. The Bats property located at 801 Francis Avenue and Relay, the Rutkowski property located at 903 Adana Road in Sudbrook Park, and the Peters property located at 322 Morris Lane in Lutherville. That's the end of that report. Thank you, Ms. Paycheck. And now will you fill us in on legislation recently passed by the County Council following our last meeting? Okay, the first bill is Bill 7923, Zoning Regulations Uses Permitted CB Zone Community Building for the purpose of permitting a community building use by right in the CB Community Business Zone and generally, generally relating to uses permitted in the CB Zone. This adds community building or other structure or land use devoted to civic, social, recreational, and educational activities as a use by right. The next one is Bill 8023, Zoning Regulations Community Building Use in BL Zone. For the purpose of permitting a community building use by right in the business local BL zone with certain requirements and generally relating to uses permitted in the BL zone. This adds community building or other structure or land use devoted to civic, social, recreational, and educational activities, not including the use of the building as a catering hall if located in a shopping center in the CCC district with a minimum gross floor area of 125,000 square feet as a use by right. And that concludes the report. That's the conclusion of our agenda. We will reconvene for a public meeting at uh, hearing at 5 p.m. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Back in all in favor? Aye. Aye. Back in nine minutes, or stay here. <laughs> Good evening again, and welcome to the Baltimore County Planning Board public hearing on the bike and pedestrian master plan. The public hearing is now called to order. My name is Nancy Hafford, the chair of the Baltimore County Planning Board, and we will now start our meeting with a roll call to account for the members that are present. Mr. Array. Here. Ms. Brophy. Here. Ms. German. Here. Mr. Hafer's not here. Mr. Heckman. Here. Mr. Heinel. Here. Mr. Hinton. Here. Mr. Holipka. Here. Mr. Johnson. Here. Mr. McGinnis. Here. Mr. Perlow. Here. Ms. Panero. Here. Mr. Warren. Here. Ms. Wolfson. Here. Thank you. This evening, we have a public hearing on the bicycle and pedestrian master plan. This item was first introduced to the board November 2nd, 2023, with a presentation from Ms. Jesse Bilek of the Department of Public Works and Transportation. Tonight, Ms. Bilek is here to further present the plan to the board. Following her presentation, board members will have a chance to ask questions. And then members of the public will have opportunities to speak on this matter. Now, join me in welcoming again, Ms. Bilek. Good evening, Chairman Hafford and members of the Planning Board. I'm very pleased to be here tonight to present to you uh, DPWT's Bicycle and Pedestrian Master Plan. Thank you. Um, so some background on the plan. Uh, the start of Baltimore County's planning and bicycle pedestrian infrastructure had its roots in the 2010 Master Plan. This plan is providing an update to the two existing plans, which is the Eastern Pedestrian and Bicycle Access Plan, which was done in 2006, and the Western Pedestrian and Bicycle Access Plan that was created in 2012. This new plan is reflecting changing development patterns and increased enthusiasm around active transportation in Baltimore County. So what will this plan do? This plan serves as our guiding document showing the most impactful locations to implement future bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. The plan identifies the policies and physical barriers to complete streets and active transportation. It provides new policies and delivers prioritized bike and pedestrian improvement projects for Baltimore County. This is our planning framework. The planning process for the plan was broken down into four sequential steps. The first step was to establish vision and goals. 
The second was to document the existing conditions. The third was to identify roles and responsibilities of key partners for implementation. And number four was to prioritize the recommendations. Throughout our planning process, input was collected from community members and stakeholders around the county. This was crucial in developing the plan's vision and goals. This is our vision statement and goals. Our vision statement is Baltimore County will consist of an active transportation network that is safe and accessible to improve the quality of life and health for users of all ages, abilities, and demographics. Our goals are to, number one, increase safety, ensure equity, expand access and connectivity, enhance public health, protect the environment, collaborate with partners, and create economic growth. This slide shows the existing conditions of bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure in the county. We have 22 miles of bicycle lanes, 24 miles of unpaved shared use paths, and 9.4 miles of paved shared use paths. And we have 2,425 miles of sidewalks. These two maps show the existing and proposed shared use paths from the previous plan. And the map on the right shows our existing pedestrian facilities both crosswalks and sidewalks. This was our network approach. Our network approach is aligned with the overall goals to ensure equity, increase safety, expand access, improve sustainability, and enhance public health. We took into account existing condition analysis and our public engagement efforts. And the draft aims to recommend a connected, comprehensive, and low stress facility for people of all ages and abilities. So in order to come up with our network approach, we use the existing network, our opportunities and constraints, and a variety of analyses such as demand, equity, safety, bike share, and a complete streets inventory. We added that to our online survey, our interactive map, our pop-up events, and our multiple public workshops. This is our demand analysis. The demand analysis helped the county identify areas of potential demand for active transportation. This demand is often expressed as where people live, work, play, shop, learn, take transit, and access community services. A composite demand score will summarize the geographic distribution of active transportation demand within Baltimore County. This is our equity analysis. While all communities offer a variety of ways to get around, not everyone has equal access to a wide range of convenient, safe, and affordable means of transportation. This uneven distribution of active transportation infrastructure can provide health, safety, mobility, and economic benefits for some sub-segments of our population while increasing hardships for others. Locating concentrations of disadvantaged populations can be the first step in identifying and prioritizing those needs. These are the network categories in the plan. The first is trails, and in this plan to clarify, trails include paved shared use and multi-use paths and off-road facilities for the sole use of people walking or biking. We have complete streets, on-road bikeways, and long-term projects. Projects identified in previous plans are included in the long-term projects category, and these projects will be considered as implementation opportunities arise. These are the recommendations for Baltimore County. We have a recommendation of about 119 miles of shared use paths, 70 miles of on-road bikeways, 33 miles of complete streets, and approximately 256 miles of long-term projects. The various types of on-road facilities are on the right-hand side of the slide, and they are bike lanes, bike boulevards, sharrows or shared lanes, separated bike lanes, and buffered bike lanes. How we select a facility. So there are many types of bike facilities, as you saw on the last slide. Some are more appropriate for certain contexts than others. Due to the variety of contexts in the county, the proposed network identifies where on-road bikeways should be prioritized, but does not specify facility recommendations. Instead, we select the facility during the design of the project. This is our bikeway and trail prioritization map. The prioritization inputs were regional connectivity, an intersect with high equity, an intersection with a high demand, 
and the number of bicycle and pedestrian crashes. So the tiers on the bottom represent um, the most connected and least connected. So tier one would be our highest priority projects, tier two are middle, and tier three are long. Our complete streets prioritization used regional connectivity, an intersection with high demand, an intersection with high equity, and the number of bicycle and pedestrian crashes. The tiers are 31 miles for the first one, 74 for the second, and 10 for the third. For those that are not familiar with what a complete street is, a complete street tries to encompass all users of the road, whether that be pedestrians, bicyclists, cars, buses, shared mobility, as well as a refuge for anyone that needs to get off the side of the road or have a break or a seat somewhere. One section of the plan speaks to pedestrian connectivity and priorities, and we called that the pedestrian priority area. So sidewalks are a key feature of a walkable community. And this portion of the plan presents a process for sidewalk and spot improvements in the county by identifying pedestrian priority areas, recommendations by priority tier, and recommendations on policies and programs to implement these facilities. The pedestrian priority areas highlight opportunities for sidewalk and spot improvements in the county, but additional analysis, site planning, and policy revisions are needed to develop and prioritize project lists. And a spot improvement is a measure that can be implemented at specific locations along pedestrian and bicycle networks to enhance safety and connectivity. This chart lists our implementation goals for the plan. For number one, expand access and connectivity. Our annual goal is to complete plan planning or design phase of at least one tier one project, design and construct at least six miles of bikeways and or shared use paths from any of the priority tiers. And the third is to design and construct at least two miles of complete streets from any of the priority tiers. For increasing safety, we wish to reduce bicycle and pedestrian crash rates by at least 3% from the prior year, enhancing public health, provide new opportunities for active transportation or recreation from the prior year, ensuring equity, 20% or more of our annual implementation funding spent in high equity and need areas, protecting the environment, decrease carbon dioxide emissions by at least 1% from the year prior, creating economic growth, initiate at least one network improvement to increase access to our commercial areas and collaborate with partners to evaluate our stakeholder participation each year and identify new opportunities. These are the next step for the plan. So that would be approval by the board and then adoption of the plan by the County Council. Below that is a list of some of the current projects that we're working on that have come out of the plan since we've been working on it. The first is called the Dundalk Heritage Connection, which is a on-road bicycle connection from historic Dundalk Town Center to North Point State Park and the future Bear Creek Trail. A feasibility study of Old Court Road Complete Streets Pilot Project, which will be the first in Baltimore County. And design of the West East Trail, which is a bicycle and pedestrian multi-use path that will go from Harford Road East to Lillian Holt Drive, as well as various bike lane projects throughout the county. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, we have a link to our story map, which is also located on our website. If anyone is interested in seeing that, we can pull that up. Thank you. Board members, before we start the public meeting, some questions, Mr. Johnson. As far as you know, does every district have a bike, bike plan, I mean bike lane? Or? Yes, every okay. district has projects in it. Yes, every, every district. And we have it broken down by district as well. So how did you tell, I mean, how can you tell, I, I, I know I um, you said your formula, but how can you tell which ones are needing more or should have expanded or? That's what our demand analysis showed us is which areas of the county were more in need of this type of infrastructure than others. And so that's how we tiered our priority lists was by using that analysis. So if a area had need for more equitable transportation and was lacking in infrastructure that got listed as a higher priority tier in our list. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you. Mr. Um, I'm curious. 
a lot of the discussion was focused on on the various bike lanes, but the the sidewalk issue. How how much sidewalks do we need to do? Do you have a sense of of how those were decided? So, I mean, for example, I could imagine to the extent I know that there's a an emphasis. I forget the the name, but to try and have kids be able to walk to school. Well, that assumes that there are sidewalk connections to the school from at least the walkable, you know, whatever part of the community is in that doesn't have bus. I mean, was that kind of thing looked at as you were deciding projects? So the pedestrian priority areas are what we did a demand analysis on to show what areas are a higher concentration that, that have less sidewalks than others. And then what we do is we can zoom into those areas and see in particular where those gaps are, but there's not like an actual list of every sidewalk gap in the county. But yes, that is in there. Ms. Brophy? Um, so this is meant to update, I guess, two different master plans, one from the Eastern um, sector and one from the Western sector from 2006, 2012. So I'm trying to understand how does this roll into master plan 2030 that we just went through and approved? Like, is this supposed to, the priority tiers in here, are they supposed to somehow match the redevelopment priority nodes um, and I apologize if I'm killing the terminology but um, is this supposed to somehow roll into that? Well it's its own separate living document but as of course we all all of our plans work together so as we review development and development comes up you know we are cued into that and then we can look at our plan and see how we can make sure that those two things mesh together. Okay but it's but its own it's its own separate it's its own living separate. breathing so it has yes. its own cycle of updating and things like that yes okay. and it's a con it's going to be a constantly updated situation so the text might not be constantly updated <laughs> but as we build it out you know those that gis data and those network connections in the plan are going to be constantly changing but the average plan update just like a master plan is about 10 years okay thank you sure. mr warren during your last presentation, I asked about the security mall area and the plan around that. I didn't see any update in there as it relates to that. And the <laughs> that right, that wasn't part of our initial master plan when we were doing it. Um, that's more of a new development as far as I'm aware. So that's not embedded in the plan when we were doing our recommendations. We so just didn't consider it, it? We didn't know it existed. Okay, but are you... Before we approve it, is that something that could be added to the sure, I, I don't know if it can necessarily be added, but I would love to see what the proposal is. Sure, definitely. Mr. Johnson, or Mr. Avery. Are you, have you been right. to Baltimore City to buy planes and be taking parking spaces from residents? Are you The microphone, please. Are you, also, are you coordinating with Baltimore City? If you're Baltimore City, the bike, yeah, bike lane is a mess, really. Yes. You're taking spaces, you can't even park, and, you know, busting, you know, tires. So what are you going to do different to make sure that it doesn't interfere with the rest? So we are a suburban county, as you know. And so when we're looking at putting in bicycle lanes, we're looking at those issues as we're doing it right now. If there is on-street parking, we're doing some sort of shared lane condition as opposed to getting rid of the parking and putting in the bike lane because we know that people need both you know so we're taking a much more holistic approach to it of trying to incorporate everybody's needs in the county not just the bicyclists but also the people that live in those houses they don't want their parking removed from the front of their house we understand that you know so it's a give and take situation but we do try our best to not do that mr johnson how confident are you in the analysis that you perform? I mean, the data that you give. How, many, how confident that you're meeting the needs of the county are you in the data that, you, um, that you're getting? I'm very confident. We used all census data. We used any data that was available to us when we were running our analyses and our models. So I'm very confident. And all of that information is in the plan and the appendices for anybody to look at. Is it based, based um, against another jurisdictions or just looking at Baltimore County trying to determine? I mean, like, do you look at another jurisdiction to kind of see what they're doing and then look at the data that we have and see are they, are they similar or just kind of basing it upon what you found out and use it for Baltimore County? So we do look at other jurisdictions' plans and what they're doing, and um, we do meet monthly with the surrounding jurisdictions to talk about bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure planning. 
So that is also incorporated into the plan. But what we wanted to do is make sure that we have a plan that's going to be the best plan for Baltimore County, because that's where everybody is living here. Shafiq. I just have a quick question. Um, trying to understand the visual a little more as you, so I'm looking at this quote. It says Joppa Road is very wide. Cars go very fast. Narrowing the street and adding protected bike lanes would do wonders for safety. Now, while that is true, like, how is that possible? I guess. So I'm, I'm not asking to be. Just, oh, I'm just trying to get a visual yeah. to under, better understand. Right. So, I mean, just because a road is recommended to be in the plan, we still have to do all of our traffic engineering analysis to make sure that that's a possibility. So, you know, we're going to look at traffic counts. We're going to look at speeds. We're going to look at, um, you know, is it going to negatively affect your traffic flow? You know, so those all go into before we would even decide or to even put a bike lane or a protected bike lane on there. So, yeah, it's not just it's on the plan. We're going to put it in there. You know, there's a lot more behind the scenes analysis that goes into it. This is just where we think if we could do that, where the, that would be the best place to put it. Sure. Mr. Halepka. Um, one of the challenges, and I, I, I have to go back and read, I'm curious about, so many of the, of the main roads in the county are state roads. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that our ability to do things on those roads is much more limited. We don't have the ability to do anything on state roads, That's unfortunately. But I kind of mean, even like putting sidewalks on this. I mean, I know this came up uh, recently when we were talking about trying to get a crossway across mm -hmm. Charles Street. Um, yeah, that's correct. I'm assuming other jurisdictions have the same kind of issues. I mean, is yeah. there any talk about trying to? So I do know um, from uh, one of our meetings recently <clears throat> with Queen Anne's County that they've had some luck with their district, getting them to partner with them a little bit more. So we do now have quarterly meetings with our district for MDOT SHA to talk about some of these issues and hopefully have a better partnership going forward. Board members, any other questions? If not, Mr. Harry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. One more question. Um, what percentage of the people in Baltimore County have a right price? What percentage? Have you done any research? I don't personally have any research, but um, I do believe that people that use bicycle, bicycles as their f first form of transportation, they're not car centric, they're bike centric. It's only about 2% of the population, but the people that use it for recreation is more in the 30 to 40% range. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Bilek. Thank you very much. We will now call on those of you who have completed and signed in sheet located in the Jefferson Building lobby to speak on this topic. Speakers will be called in the order that you registered. Speakers, please remember you have two minutes uh, to speak and provide us with your name. And if you're re representing an organization, please let us know that too. I think the first one is Lee or Lynn Paddock. I think it's on now. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Hofford. Um, I'm a resident uh, in Towson, uh, near Towson University. I moved here about a year ago from Bethesda. I used to ride about a thousand miles a year on protected lanes and trails. When I moved up here, um, my ability to bike has substantially uh, been diminished, maybe 200 miles this year. And that's because um, I don't um, bike where there are not protected lanes. So my um, principal points for you is, first of all, trails is the number one priority. That's where most recreational bikers want to be. Protected lanes are really important. If a lane is not protected, a lot of bikers, especially in heavy traffic, just won't do that. So poles or even concrete parking barriers like they use in Washington, D.C., are a better option um, so they prevent cars from uh, getting in those lanes. Um, the one trail that we have, that the NCR trail up north, uh, needs a lot of repair. So repair should be part of the plan. 
Uh, the trail is okay, but it's fairly rough. Uh, and connecting uh, Towson to the NCR trail would seem to be a real priority. Um, the university, the other universities here would provide recreational access. And then finally, um, I think in protected lanes and on trails, our goal should be zero crashes, uh, especially the protected lanes. So uh, let's think about bigger goals on protecting bicyclists. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the last speaker we have is James Pizzuro. Hi, I'm James Pizzuro, Towson resident, treasurer of my HOA, member of Strong Towns of Baltimore, uh, graduate of the inaugural cohort of the county's Community Planning Institute. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and speak about the bicycle and mass pedestrian master plan. First off, I, I do recommend the plan be approved and adopted. Uh, it's an important first step in addressing the systemic problems with our county's insufficient bike and pedestrian infrastructure. Today, most residents usually drive to get where they need to go, not because they're lazy or don't want to use alternative modes, but because navigating our built environment means it's often unsafe and inconvenient to walk or bike instead. This only serves to reinforce the idea that walking and biking isn't for everyone. But the research cited in the plan is clear. By making it easier for more people to walk and bike to get around more often, we can reduce injuries and fatalities, make our residents healthier, improve our air quality, and stimulate more sustainable growth. Given all these benefits, it would be irresponsible not to work towards achieving these goals with haste. To that end, I'm disappointed by the county's failure to implement quick build projects that would allow DPWNT to experiment with safety interventions that could ultimately inform longer term, more expansive projects outlined in the bicycle and pedestrian master plan. For example, stripe bump outs with flex posts can set the stage for concrete bump outs with bollards, stripe medians can tra transition into planted medians with new street trees, etc. If we're serious about achieving our goals responsibly, we need more residents to start feeling more comfortable navigating more parts of our county on foot and by bike more often and as soon as possible. That's why up to 38 years to see the completion of all tier one supposedly high priority projects at the cost of hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars each is unacceptable, as is even the plan's most optimistic timeline of six years given six times more annual funding. Quick build projects would allow residents to enjoy many of the benefits of these larger projects much sooner and at a fraction of the price. I implore this board and county staff to work together on this one. Look no further than Baltimore City or any other neighboring jurisdiction for some inspiration on how to get started right away. Thank you. Madam Chair. Um, I have a couple of comments and questions. I agree with my colleagues here about that the plan was drafted and sent out for comments. When was it? Like last year, last fall? Um, we had two rounds of interactive public comments for more than 30 days, as well as three public workshops and seven. Uh, yeah. uh, Ms. Violet, we are going to need to start your comments at the microphone. So just, let me just clarify the question. When was the, the draft plan first put out? Draft plan was first put out in late uh, 2022 in October. Yeah, and so we had it open for more than 30 days for comment. So that may explain, Todd, why, you know, Security Mall wasn't in there. Um, but I don't disagree with you. I mean, it's a major, major potential development. Um, and then I also agree with Emily that um, it seems odd that it wasn't coordinated with the master plan 2030 and the requirement and the hope to build more walkable uh, communities that are less dependent on the car. Um, so that disconnect seems a little odd to me. I know it's their separate functions, but it seems that they ought to work towards the same goal. So that's my comment. Um, I have questions pertaining to the, uh, I assume you all got the uh, letters that we received in the last few days from some other members of the community. Uh, one comment was, um, how come the state roads aren't in the master plan? 
And I understand that we can't do anything about them, but I've seen in other jurisdictions, like Howard County, I know, for instance, they include that because that's their vision. So that when um, they are talking to SHA and other, other entities, that they have a plan. This is what our community wants. Uh, we want bike lanes on York Road. We want bike lanes on Reisterstown Road. Without that plan, you know, what's the incentive for SHA to do anything? I would question. And a couple other community members also had the same question. Um, and then I guess there was some other comments about um, uh, as kind of checking our progress as we go. And um, apparently there's a recommendation to like check it in five years. Um, you know, have you thought about maybe we should be reporting on this maybe every year? Right, I think someone misinterpreted that because in our plan we have yearly statistics that we are going to be putting out okay, to the great. public. Yes, Very good. so I think that was just a misunderstanding. Okay, that's all I have. Mr. Wright. I, uh, Microphone, please. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm, I agree with Mark and Emily. So, can you make sure that it is coordinated with the master plan? I mean, that's the goal is for us all to be working towards the same thing, of course. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay, if not, Shafiq. Uh, last question. I really did enjoy the comments by the uh, speakers tonight. Um, is there uh, is is there a part of the plan that we'll talk about repairing the trail since that seems to be what um, bikers might be more, most interested in? Right, I do understand about the maintenance plan, but because we don't really have any bicycle and protection infrastructure at the moment, we didn't see that as a priority to be talking about in the plan. We're just trying to actually make more of a network. A lot of the maintenance that people speak to <clears throat> are owned and maintained, such as the DNR or our Department of Recreation and Parks. But DPW and T as a whole doesn't really own very many trails of such as of yet. So, of course, there'll have to be maintenance money. Got it. Thank you. A definite. Last check. No one? And I'm sure if I made just a couple of comments. Um, one, the NCR trail is state. Um, so again, that goes back to state county coordination and historically coordination with state highway administration that has been abysmal. Um, I think under the current leadership, it's improving and opens up some opportunities that we probably haven't seen in a number of years. Um, secondly, the plan at, if the council adopts this, this plan, it becomes an amendment to the master plan. Uh, just as when we saw the uh, land preservation plan that Rec and Parks brought in, it, its adoption becomes an amendment. The amendment would be to the 2020 master plan because that's the only adopted plan right now. But upon the adoption of the 2030 master plan, it would roll into it and become an amendment to the master plan. Whether it's fully integrated sufficiently, that probably needs to be addressed, but we then use in, in reviews for future development, we look at the bicycle pedestrian plan as well as, as other community plans. Thank you for that clarification, Mr. Lafferty. All right, one last opportunity, board members. Well, this is the conclusion of our public hearing. As a reminder, this item is tentatively scheduled for a vote on the next board meeting. That meeting will be on January 4th, 2024. Uh, so there is no other board meetings in December. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Chair, before you conclude, if I just may thank the board who has had a public hearing at every meeting since September. <laughs> Uh, you all have been extraordinary. The attendance and attention has been amazing. I just want to compliment all of you for the, the work you've put in. Um, and hold on to your hats because <laughs> January and February are going to be pretty 
pretty raucous as well. We have a lot coming up with cap capital budget and then CZMP uh, public hearings in February and deliberations after that. So really appreciate all the hard work and your commitment. Uh, and enjoy the month off of December <laughs> if you can. Uh, but really do appreciate all the work you, you've been put in. Thank you, Mr. Lafferty. But also, we want to thank you and your staff for all the heavy lifting you've done. You've done an amazing, amazing job, and you make it a lot, very, a lot easier for us. We greatly appreciate it, and it does not go unnoticed. Mr. Array. Well, I was going to echo the same thing that you said. Thank you. Uh, your team, your OAP, uh, you guys are wonderful. And um, I know that Taylor is doing it today, but she's the sidekick. Yeah, you know, Taylor is the sidekick, <laughs> making sure that we don't forget anything. Thank you. You did a good job, Crystal. Yeah, Crystal. All right. See you all next year and a happy holidays.